today we'll be starting with a short introduction. I'll let you know a little bit about Plant Protein Alliance and then we'll have our feature presentation around uh, extrusion technology followed by a 20 minute question and answer and some closing notes to let you know what the events are. So I'm Shannon Snaden. I'm the marketing specialist at Plant Protein Alliance. So I help with all the, the technologies around these webinars and the promotions. Barb is the communications manager. She runs all of the social media accounts and does a fantastic job. She also coordinates the newsletters. Volker Lammers is our uh, special guest today. He's the platform manager at DIL um, and is a subject matter expert when it comes to food innovation. As well, we have uh, Karen, who is the head of the DIL office, which is a new office in located in Calgary, Alberta. And we're very happy to have her here and have some, some different opportunities when it comes to doing value-added processing of um, our, our agro products. So the Plant Protein Alliance, it's all about connecting people to help Alberta become global leaders in plant-based ingredients processing. So most of the plant-based proteins that we produce in Alberta, we just ship, ship them off to either China or the United States. And there's not a lot of processing that's happening in Alberta. And this is a great opportunity for us. So we're working together to facilitate the development of a diverse, profitable and sustainable plant protein ingredient processing industry in Alberta. And to, to do that, part of what we, we offer is different networking events, workshops uh, to teach people about the skills that they need. Um, and to bring people together to have those partnerships that they need to have that thriving plant protein ecosystem. And we do get high, pretty positive results from our, our events that we've had so far. We also have two monthly newsletters. So the first one features news and stories about plant protein as well. The second one features all the different member updates that we have. So if you're interested, you can sign up at ppaa.ca uh, slash communication slash newsletters. I highly recommend it. They're very well written and very interesting. As well, if you're interested in helping to support the development of this value-added uh, plant processing, then you can consider becoming a member at the Plant Protein Alliance. We're offering a special incentive currently of 15 months of membership for the, the price of, of 12. And you can get that uh, deal on our website at ppaa.ca. And now for the feature presentation uh, with a look at how meatless beets are made with Volker. So Volker, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now so that you can go ahead and share your screen. Thanks again for PPAA for um, considering me as a presenter in this interesting uh, topic. I'm uh, pleased um, to present to you today and um, uh, great that so many people joined this, this webinar today. So the topic is our meatless meats uh, made. And this presentation will hopefully give you a good overview of um, extrusion technologies, uh, how extrusion can be used to prepare meat analogs or meatless type of meats. And um, I will also share a few videos of showing and uh, demonstrating the technology. First of all, I would like to give a brief introduction of uh, DIL, of our institute. So DIL stands for uh, Deutsches Institut für Lebensmitteltechnik, which is a non-profit research association located here in northwest Germany, so close to the Dutch border and to the North Sea. Founded uh, in 1983, and um, we have approximately at the moment roughly 200 employees. And as you see, we our headquarter is here in this lovely little city, Quakenbrück. Uh, but we also have offices in Berlin, Karlsruhe, and uh, Brussels. And now, uh, more recently, uh, one office in Calgary. That's uh, Karin. So uh, that's also. Um, how the connection uh, to PPAA was made. So uh, the, our director and my boss is uh, Dr. Volker Heinz. And the special uh, tea about DIL is our legal status is uh, a registered association. And I will uh, show this in uh, the next slide, uh, what this is. So here's an overview of our campus at DIL. Um, we have a mechanical workshop here, uh, an engineering department. We have like a business and innovation park uh, where startups can be located for new ideas. And then we do a little bit here in the area of uh, feed technology. And we have a center of food physics, which deals mainly on the structure and functionality of foods and uh, applying different um, physical methods. And then we have our pilot hall, 
for food innovation and process engineering, and this is where my team is also located. As just said, we are a registered association, meaning we have roughly 180 members being uh, members of, of DIL. Those are mainly companies from the food, feed, and beverage industry, but also from the uh, machinery uh, and equipment manufacturers are included and companies from the area around, so small, medium companies, but also startups and large enterprises. And everyone can become a member of our uh, institute. So what are the main topics we're dealing at at DIL? It's food technologies. And if we look at this graph here, basically in the food system, we have the nutritional sciences, we have the food sciences and agricultural sciences. DIL is mainly located here in the area of food science. So this is basically focused on food processing. And we say, okay, it's everything from the field until your mouth, until you eat it. Do you eat it? Then we need to make the link to the nutritional sciences. So this is our, um, based our core competences. Uh, we are divided in uh, different platforms here at DIL and the group I'm responsible for is the process engineering team. And we have basically four different strategic pillars. First one, publicly funded research projects. So we apply for federal European funds to do our pre-competitive research. If those are successful, then we try to take these uh, findings and to develop uh, new processes and products with the industrial partners. And the industrial partners can be the members or can everyone basically who wants to uh, collaborate with us. So we do feasibility studies, product and process development. Then mainly in the area of meat analogs, which will also be the topic of today. We also offer uh, toll production services. So we have a food grade lab where we can uh, produce uh, foods in a high quality uh, standard that can be also used for uh, retail later on. And we have here the wet meat analogs, TVP, but also some other special extruded goods. And uh, beyond that, in collaboration with our workshop, we've developed some type of equipment for extruders, namely the cooling dies, which are used to produce, needed to produce some type of meat analogs. Um, those can be used pilot uh, scale up to full production scale. Yeah, our mission is to transfer science into industry-ready solutions. So here in this map, it's just a summary of the collaborations with uh, industry partners in 2019. We mainly are having partners in, in Germany and Europe, but are also act globally. I don't want to spend too much time today on the reasons why we are all interested in uh, needless needs and uh, in the technologies behind these two slides because beef is probably one of the most liked meat products. But if, you, uh, if cattle were a country, they would rank third in greenhouse gas emissions, right behind China and the United States. And this shows that there is really an impact of, of the animals, of uh, breeding and eating meat on the environment. And the same is here in the combined uh, greenhouse gases in the same range like the big petrol companies. And so, so this is the reason why we may, to, may need to reconsider our uh, eating uh, behavior. This is also accelerated by this uh, current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We see that this has an impact somehow on the consumer behavior. So maybe people want to change something and uh, are looking more and more into more sustainable products and here are some some headlines that shows okay uh, we may see a shift to meat substitutes now more and more and this pandemic is accelerating uh, the rise of these type of products but okay now let's enter uh, technology part it will mainly be about uh, food extrusion and protein extrusion basically and to create a very good tasty product at the end, we need to know a little bit how the equipment works and how the screw needs to be configured in the extruder. Then we need to know uh, the protein sources. There are so many different uh, proteins available, but the functionality is 
quite different. Um, uh, and then, yeah, some uh, this die design is important, but also then how does the structure look like? Does it more resemble like a beef, like chicken or pork or different other um, type of products? And then what can we make out of it? Uh, and this will be, um, I will give some this presentation. This is an overview here about um, potential protein sources that we've investigated so far in extrusion processes, but uh, may not be complete. So um, it's just an overview and it's uh, classified here into plant-based, animal-based, meat-based and alternative-based products. So why do I include here also the animal-based and meat-based? So animal-based might be interesting for uh, vegetarian products. And meat-based is maybe not for food, but the pet food industry is quite interested in uh, these type of products and making hybrid products with the plant-based ones. Um, whereas here, the plant-based sources are the most applied ones and uh, best known, maybe. So where we would consider uh, soy protein and wheat as, and maybe pea as the golden standards today, where uh, any products available on the market are based on. And some others quite interesting like uh, lupine, uh, potato, but also sunflower, pumpkin and rapeseed proteins, which are byproducts from the oil production. And this gives a little bit the loop of how can we use side streams or byproducts from other process industries and use them to uh, valorize them and make new type of products. And this would lead me now to, to Shannon, to, to the first poll. Uh, just let us know which type of plant protein are you most interested in learning about? Volker's told us about some very interesting ones. I put the ones that are most common to Alberta. Pretty clear for the, for the pulses. Yeah. I would yeah. also agree that this is biggest interest and yeah, because the availability is quite good shows some interesting uh, functionalities, these type of products. Uh, this slide is about the protein quality. So it's not only just the source. Every source will have slightly different uh, functionalities and properties, of course. And here, uh, just an overview as an example of soy protein, where we um, distinguish between flowers, meals, concentrates, and isolates. On the market, there are different qualities available and they are classified according to their protein uh, content. You can imagine the higher the protein content, also the higher the functionality is, and also the costs are also higher. And maybe also the, the processing is more intense. This is just um, good to know. And then the quality of a raw material not only depends on the protein content, but also on the solubility, fat content, fiber content, and remaining components, which are also still in the mix. So if we have a flour, we also have the carbohydrates, fibers, and, and, and other components, which will impact the, the final structure of, of the food. And then also the pre-processing of the raw materials is crucial as it may alter functionality and the native uh, composition of the products of the raw materials. And then this slide um, also, and, and now we make it a little bit different. What reservations might you have about plant-based proteins? Um, are you worried about the taste, uh, the ingredients, level of processing? Are you concerned about additives or cost? What's the thing that... that... Okay, this is not so clear as, as the first poem, but I would say it's a good answer. Taste is most important factor. Yes, if it doesn't taste the food, people won't buy it. That is the biggest challenge that needs to have a good taste. And I'm not saying it has to taste like meat. Maybe taste can be a little bit different, but at least it should be a tasty, tasty product. When we're talking about plant proteins, we are often challenged by off taste. Many of the raw materials uh, are quite bitter, have 
like a typical taste. If you have a pea protein, it may taste a little bit like pea and, and not like chicken. So um, those things need to be uh, considered when you create these type of products. Our perspective from the engineering perspective, um, the texture is also very important. We need to create similar texture and, and uh, microstructures as, uh, as we know it from, from the meat, because the texture will have an inf impact on the haptic properties. So does it, uh, if, do we have the same feeling uh, when you eat it like when you eat a piece of meat. And uh, here, the um, uh, fibrosity, elasticity, and firmness are uh, important characteristics. And also color is important. So if we talk about some um, oil seed proteins, they may have a greenish color or brownish color. And um, so this needs to be considered and respected when you develop new type of products. And I think processability was also um, uh, mentioned in this poll. Yeah. How do you produce these type of products is uh, requires some know-how and expertise and typical factors can be temperature, pressure, shear and time. Um, I think another one was the additives. Uh, how can you create good tasty products with minimal uh, addition of food additives and other ingredients. I will come later to that, but it's also very important. When we talk about the extrusion technologies to produce vegan products, we mainly uh, consider dry variant and a wet variant. Uh, so the dry one, um, I call it here uh, TVP, texturized vegetable proteins, and HME, so high moisture extrudates. And uh, those two products I will explain a little bit more in detail in the following slides. So here you see the, the products. They are basically intermediate products, um, so to say. And these ones are characteristics uh, characterized by an, an expanded um, uh, product property by air bubbles and the right one by uh, um, uh, by a high moisture content and uh, fiber structures, as you can see it here in the image. So um, basically, the extruder can be very similar for both um, type of products and also the source materials may be very similar. So you need a good uh, protein source. You mix it basically with water in the extruder and then depending on the water content, you principally or simply say go to TVP or to the HME products. And then based on these intermediate products, you can create different type of end products. If I look, uh, we look to this uh, schematic, you see here an extruder, we have a motor, we have a screw section here in the middle, we have a barrel that can be heated or cooled, and we have a die at the end. For the TVP, we have short expansion dies um, so we have the TVP and the HME, same extruder setting basically, but differences in the temperature profile and mainly in the die at the ends and how these dies look like, how the processes are, I will show you now. So for those who do not know how an extruder screw look like, here's an example. These screws can be configured uh, modular, so you have conveying, mixing, kneading elements that are responsible for the right uh, thermomechanical energy input you put into your products. And um, so now you have mostly heard everything about the theory, and now I will show uh, some, some videos shot in our pilot plant. You see here um, powder, protein, fed into the extruder, it's heated up, and then at the end um, it's extruded through an extruder die or through an expansion die uh, where um, an endless strand or here in this case four endless strands come out of the extruder die um, at temperatures higher than 100 degrees Celsius so they expand and um, then uh, uh, they are 
So there were the endless strands. And when I put a cutter in front of it, uh, I can create small type of pieces. This looks like this. So, yeah, so this uh, process is also known from um, yeah, snack products, puffed cereals, uh, also for breakfast cereals. It's a similar, similar process that is applied. And in some cases, as you still have some water inside the extrudate, you may require some post-drying. This is a belt dryer where we have such a few uh, that is dried uh, afterwards. And um, the benefit is that you have at the end uh, shelf stable, um, shelf stable product um, that you can store for yeah, several months basically. And here we go. Here are some, some examples of different uh, types of TVP that we've um, um, prepared in our, our lab. And I also have them here. So this one here is a uh, soy, um, soy protein with wheat flour. So a mixture um, that is quite interesting. Also uh, pumpkin TVP looks pretty different. Um, uh, it's this one uh, and, and others. Yeah, we also have, it's not the plant-based stuff, but also interesting is uh, insect protein. So we do also do a little bit on uh, uh, insect TVP and yeah, use them for burgers, etc. And how do you make products based on these ingredients? You basically put them into uh, water, so you have to rehydrate them. And then you can see it here maybe, I, oops, I put it uh, into water before the meeting, and then uh, they soak up the water, and you have like a sponge uh, structure, and um, you can further pull it apart. Maybe I tried if you can see something, I don't know. All, all the water goes on my keyboard, not the best idea. Um, but uh, yeah, this is how it works. And then uh, you have different protein, uh, different types uh, with different elasticity and some may be used better for sausages, some others for uh, um, uh, chicken nuggets or something like this. So um, yeah, you need to know what your final application will be. Um, then I'll, now I will switch over to the wet extrudate or to the high moisture extrusion. Um, uh, and it's basically the same, similar raw materials, mixing with water, with a lot of more water, and you create these type of intermediate products, and then you can create final ones out of it. And how this work, I will show you in, ah, okay. First, a little bit of theory. I talked about the cooling dice first. So we have the extruder. This part is the hot part. It's heated up to, I would say, yeah, 130, 140 degrees Celsius. And before it enters the cooling die, it's a little bit cooled down. And in this die, which is basically a heat exchanger, heat is removed by a double jacketed of the, of the cooling dice. And, uh, then you create such a similar or a laminar flow profile inside this cooling die. And um, the material that is still flowable at the end of the extruder solidifies slowly. And then layer by layer, you create uh, the um, fiber structure. And this fiber structure is fixed basically in this uh, cooling die. And at the end, you uh, have a semi-solid or solid um, product with fiber structure. Here you see some examples. Here's a cooling die on the bottom pictures showing the exit of the material. And when you pull this apart, this is always the best test basically to show or to demonstrate the uh, fiber structure. But you will see that depending on your raw material, 
the structures may be completely different. So you j cannot just simply say, okay, I have a, a protein, I put it into the extruder, and I play a little bit around, and then I get the final uh, or nice structure. No, you have to put in a little bit more of exercises, basically. And if you have a flower, concentrate or isolate, structures may change. Also on this raw material source, you will create different results. So basically, you need to uh, modify a complete um, yeah, formulation that is a little bit more complex than maybe just one one source. So in the extruder, you may blend the raw materials, proteins, maybe optional, some starches, fibers, or other materials. You mix them with water, optionally with oil, flavors, or other ingredients, uh, spices, um, seasonings, for example. Then after the extruder, you may cut the product, and uh, then this is what we call intermediate product that can be further processed into uh, final products. So to stabilize them, they are not shelf stable, so you may need to freeze them and to thaw, or you directly make the treatment afterwards with some other spices, marinades or uh, panades or whatever. Right, and then packaging and you have a final final product. Following a few videos, different materials. And this setup is yeah, also used in uh, the food industry. And what I think very tasty products are on the market based on this, uh, this system here. As many people do not like to have soy in their formulations, um, other ingredients are of interest. One of my favorites is pumpkin seed protein. I just showed the dry variant. So now you see the, the wet one. Look from the color like um, like meat, but um, it has a very nice nice structure and the taste is good. And what I like the best is really a minimal processed byproduct from the oil production. So um, this is really giving, from my perspective, or it adds value to to this uh, food system. And here you see the structure. So um, you see the fibers, and also when you eat it, you have a similar bite to to a piece of, of meat. Um, yes. And here we have a different type of cooling dye, which is uh, yeah, I would say one of our latest uh, innovations to increase the throughput because you also need always need to consider the throughput per, uh, yeah, per hour, basically, to have a cost-efficient and affordable process. And here we can go to up higher, much higher um, processes. Uh, this is uh, a pea protein that is extruded. You will see, okay, this is now more like an angular um, design shape and here you see a little bit uh, the fiber structure. Um, I made this video on last week and I, tr I just tried it with one hand because in the other one I had the camera but you see here um, the, the fibers and I think I have a better one in uh, only the protein source with water plus the extruder or plus the technology. So it's a very clean uh, labeled uh, product until, until this point.
we would be curious in what type of uh, products you're uh, mostly interested in. Like a, a tie between beef and chicken. Oh yes, uh, the chicken I have here, so, some example, I think chicken uh, or the HME process is very suitable for um, chicken process uh, or for, for chicken analogs and can be on, on, on a soy basis or pea basis or others. So when you talk about chicken, chicken has a, like a white color or it's uh, very, very light. So you may not, you cannot use protein sources that have a very dark color from the beginning on. I mean, you could work with uh, some additives like um, titan dioxide or others, but this may not be uh, desired for certain reasons. I think uh, beef is also very uh, challenging but interesting, and fish we see an increasing interest over the last few months. So many are talking about meat alternatives, many products are on the market, but more and more fish products uh, come. So very interesting. Thanks for the poll. So just a few images from, from products we made, like a chicken wrap, if you, you can make different types of it from the same material. Here we have like a burger patty. Um, and this burger patty is basically uh, based on a mixture of wet and dry uh, extruded proteins. So we think that is good, good option to improve the texture. To our knowledge today, the majority of the beef uh, or burgers are based on, on dry products. So also you can uh, make, um, you fr can fry them or you make a panade. And before I will close, I will show you three um, slides about the cooling dye equipment that we offer and that we um, have here. So it's this FKD 750, it's a pilot scale uh, cooling dye uh, that is mainly used for R&D purposes. So where we do a lot of uh, product developments, uh, formulation work, develop new type of recipes, testing different ingredients and their functionality. Um, yeah, it's characterized by two cooling circuits. So I can adapt the cooling profile in the cooling die a little bit. Um, and it's uh, operating in the range between 10 to yeah, 60 kilograms per hour and um, good cleanability. And we can also optional include some inline measurement, which may be interesting from the from a research perspective. And we have a larger one where we also uh, showed a few images. This is this FKD 2100. So the number here, so it stands for flat uh, cooling die. And uh, the number uh, gives you an indication on the cross section of the die because um, it is an indicator how much material you can put through uh, the machine. Uh, it is modular, can be used up to four segments, and we have a higher throughput of yeah, between 130 and 240 kilograms per hour. Yeah, and then last one, so the, the latest um, die uh, we've developed is, has this annular profile, and here we can go up to like 500 kilograms per hour and this is a point where we would say it makes um, the, the process, the HME process, really uh, affordable and um, profitable. This is a figure of our uh, pilot plant here. Um, we have an extruder, cooling die, and cutting equipment, cooling. And now we will also have like uh, freezing, um, cryogenic freezing, because freezing is also important. If you have the wet type of product, you need to stabilize it until it gets to the, to the supermarket. We do a little bit of research, as mentioned earlier in the presentation. We have, like here on the wet, a scanning electron microscopy image of meat analog from soy, and on the right, a muscle meat from, from beef. I mean, you can see that we have some fibers here aligned 
that look quite similar and are also in the same uh, size range. So, I mean, this is really a microscopic um, uh, image. Um, it does not tell you about how good it tastes, but it gives you an indication that we are able to create similar structures by this technology. And we also developed some type of like uh, tools to determine like the, the fiber index and to investigate how is the fibrosity, uh, how does it look like. And with this, I come to my conclusion and the summary, uh, just to briefly compare the two processes I've presented. We have the TVP here on the left, the dry products, and the right one, the HME products. I would say the dry ones are easier to work with uh, because they have long shelf life and um, uh, can be very nicely used for burgers, minced meat, and some sausages. And uh, they are a little bit cheaper because the technology is available on high throughput rates. So there are machines available with up to 1.5 tons per hour. Um, and the HME is a little bit newer technology um, where we have a wet product that needs to be chilled or frozen or somehow stabilized, but it resembles more like the muscle meat of chicken, beef, and pork. And um, yeah, and at the moment it's available at medium throughput rates, medium to high throughput rates. Yeah. And uh, this is a figure of my uh, teammates in uh, the extrusion or process engineering team, experimenting a lot, having fun in the lab. And um, with this, I would like to um, finalize and uh, thank you very much for your intention for joining this seminar uh, early in the morning when you're in Canada, maybe in the afternoon when you're in Europe or somewhere else. And a uh, big thank you to uh, the PPAA for organizing this event. So we've got a few questions coming in for you, uh, Volker. So one of the first questions is what the percentage of water is in a HME products? Uh, so in HME products, start from, I would say, 50% if you have a ratio of one to one, uh, one, one water and one protein. But we normally apply water contents of around 60, 63 to 65% if we have a standard. And then I guess someone else asked about TVP. So what is the, the, ratio, the moisture ratio for that? Yeah, so it will be uh, in the process, just as a rule of thumb, around 20%. And then you can dry it down below um, around 8% so that you have a, a stable product uh, from a microbiological uh, perspective also. Yeah. Okay. And so there was a question about how do you partner um, with uh, DIL? Like what's the process of working with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at the beginning, I showed our different uh, pillars and uh, very important for us are the R&D uh, collaborations um, with partners from the yeah, food, food industry. As I said, can be startups up to large enterprises. And just uh, send us um, a contact and ask what, what is your problem or what, do you would, or what would you like to, to solve or what you would like to do. Maybe we already have some answers. Uh, for that, or we can, um, yeah, just, or the simplest way is we operate on a service basis, on a daily extrusion rate, you have to pay a little bit, then we do the service, or uh, we do it like an R&D uh, contract and we develop something new uh, together. Okay. So different options, we are, we are open. Right. And uh, just as a note for in Canada here, you actually, um, have a partnership with the University of Guelph and have equipment yeah, in Guelph, right? Yes. So it was last year um, that one of the, the small cooling die was uh, installed in uh, University of Guelph. It was on the professorship of Mario Martinez, but he left uh, Guelph and returned to Europe. So at the moment, I'm not aware who is... Um, operating or responsible for, for that. Um, 
but if there is an interest, I could ask to make a, a, a contact and they have the same or similar equipment. Uh, okay. Um, and so I guess just people are asking about moisture. They're also wondering about the temperature for HME extrusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so in the extruder, we have the, the hot part where we heat up the protein water mixture up to uh, 140 or maybe 160 degrees Celsius. Then also the residence time is important. How long is it in the, in the uh, extruder mm -hmm. section? can be up to two, three, or four minutes, so to say. And in the cooling dissection, we cool then down to something between 70 and 90 degrees Celsius, typically. Okay. And then um, are you mainly using isolates or concentrates as raw plant protein material? Yeah. So mainly concentrates. Um, for the reasons that they are cheaper than the isolates. And if I have an isolate, maybe uh, the, the texture is too firm because mm -hmm. it has such a high functionality that it's really uh, um, very firm and you may have to mix it with starches. But uh, this also depends on the source. It's very important. So when I work with soy, we would recommend uh, concentrates and for P, for example, P isolates are um, oh, okay. preferred. So it depends a little bit. Right, okay. And are there bleaching processes to uh, lighten darker proteins to make chicken uh, type? Yeah, for, for, for chicken, um, we know in some cases or products it's titan uh, dioxide and this is what we've also used it works nicely, makes a light um, color. Um, uh, but like for in, in France, I think it's not allowed anymore, for example. And then uh, some, some calcium or some others uh, you may uh, add in a low percentage uh, fraction. Okay. Um, and what's the average shelf life of HME? Yeah, so if you have like the high water content, um, in it and you, it depends on how you pack it. If you just have it um, chilled, it behaves, I would say, yeah, similar to meat. Um, so maybe a few days, maybe a week. Maybe if you uh, pack it like under a controlled atmosphere, it may be longer. Mm. Directly after the extruder, it has nearly uh, zero contamination as it comes from the hot machine, but it's a little bit difficult to, to handle. So to our knowledge, many of those products uh, are frozen at one step, and then you have, have a long shelf life. Okay, yeah, so that's why they're frozen, to give them yeah. the longer shelf life. Um, so, so what is the fat and protein content for TVP and HME? I also have to say it, it depends, it depends on, the on, the, on the source of protein. Yeah. And on the, on the formulation and on the final product you want to create. I mean, chicken does not have that much fat uh, in general, so you may not add too much uh, oil. Uh, but if you want to make like a fatty products, um, more than 10% of oil will alter the structure formation because it acts like a lubricant or like a grease in the extruder, you know, and then it's a little bit more difficult to bring in the energy and to, to create the fibers. So generally it's easier to work with lower oil content or with oil contents below 10%, just roughly. Okay. And is there um, an ideal residence time for TVP? For, for the TVP, I would say it can be rather short because, um, I, I mean, what is important for TVP is that you have only little water and this needs to be, and the protein needs to be hydrated very well. So you need to mix very good that the water is evenly distributed. But I would say this can be in a, in a few minutes, so two or uh, two or three minutes. Uh, if you have really high throughput, 
and then you can adapt a little bit with the screw configuration to adjust um, the, the, the texture or the, the formation. Yeah. Right. So, um, and for burger patties, could you, um, can you just talk a little bit about how you, uh, how rapeseed or what we would call canola uh, protein works? Mm -hmm. Maybe I have some, some rapeseed even here. No, uh, I do not. Um, I don't know if we've made final burger patties out of the rapeseed, so um, I cannot uh, tell you too much about this. Um, uh, but um, for every sauce, you, we, we do this type of test. So you, we put it into water, uh, what is the water absorption, um, and then what is the, the, uh, the texture? Is it soft or is it uh, strong? And for the rapeseed, um, yeah, we have something more like uh, these small TVP uh, stuff. This is now pumpkin, but it looks a little bit similar to this one. Right. So it's nine o'clock, which are uh, here in Alberta. So, um, which would be the end of our webinar. Are you good to stay and answer some more questions, Volker? Oh, yeah, I yeah? have. Okay, we've got lots of questions. So, um, those of you who have to go, we'll let you go and say thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Yeah. And um, we'll uh, maybe continue and answer some more questions for uh, those of you who'd like to stay. So, um, so th this question says TVP binds and releases water, but the high moisture extruded products binds water tightly, um, which involves not releasing water during cooking beef. Uh, the meatless burgers. So do you have an idea to slack the fiber formation in high moisture extruded products? I'm not sure if I got this question. Uh, so it's, I guess correct. it's sort of, uh, do you have an idea so that um, in to get so that there's not so much water in uh, cooking the, in the high moisture like the HME extruded products is that a problem in HME extruded products I mean I said in the extruder with HME I have quite a lot of water but it's also well binds uh, basically and I still also have the option if I do some post treatment that uh, the material can take up a little bit more water even uh, so to adjust a little bit the uh, the, the softness. If I have a little bit more water, it's getting softer. But I'm not sure if that answers the, yeah, the question. Yeah, it's a pretty technical <laughs> question. Um, yeah. Besides insect protein, what other alternative proteins have you worked on using extruder technology? Yeah, uh, so, so we once have, um, had a PhD here on uh, algae protein, microalgae. That works, but it also relates uh, to a greenish color. Uh, and the taste is also, maybe it works for fish products. I don't know. It's a little bit um, different. I don't think, yeah. We've once used with uh, some type of mycoproteins. Uh, I think these are a very interesting uh, source. Um, but only a few companies are able to provide uh, that type of material um, right. in a good Quality, but we've done some um, very nice tests with some microproteins. I like. Them. Okay. Um, and what effect does carbohydrates or fat have on the texture when using flour or concentrates? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when I have a flour, I uh, the 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 carbohydrate concent uh, concentration is already high. Maybe it may be higher than the protein concentrate. So because if I have like a flour or a meal, it's based on uh, yeah, carbohydrates, mainly starches, protein, and uh, maybe fibers. Um, so the higher I am with the Protein concentrate uh, with protein concentration. I may add a little bit of uh, starch to um, make it the the 
the product a little bit more elastic, I would say. And oil, as I mentioned before, um, can create some issues at higher um, addition levels, so higher than 10. Um, just as an example, the, uh, the one of the images or videos with the pumpkin, that worked for some reason very well, but it has a low protein content and a, very, and a high oil content. And surprisingly, it's also worked. So that must, be, must relate to the protein functionality. So it's not so simple to say it's uh, just right. protein content or all kinds of... And in some cases, when we have um, high... Um, High protein values and it is too, uh, yeah, too strong or too fluffy. Some fibers may add because fibers take a little bit more of the water, and uh, this um, results in different uh, functions, different textures. Okay, well, we'll just do a couple more questions and then let everybody go. Um, one was um, about sensory tests. Have you done sensory tests on your products? And is there one protein that is, um, s seems more acceptable from that perspective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, I mean, we've done internal tests, but we also know from some of our clients what type of products they uh, um, sell. And we have a... Uh, consumer uh, science lab um, which uh, we've collaborate and um, yes yeah, soy as I said at the beginning is kind of the golden standard because it has a good functionality it has a reasonable price and the taste is also okay um, so because it's quite um, flat taste so it's easier to put some uh, spices or flavors into it. Mm. Um, and it has a good availability. Uh, when, it, when I have like the pea or some, some other ingredients, um, uh, yeah, I have these off tastes, particularly for the like rapeseed, uh, maybe um, uh, pumpkin and uh, partially uh, pea then you, you can try to optimize your formulation or yeah, it's also possible to add some masking flavors. This is what some, some companies are doing. Okay. So, all right. Well, I think we'll, we've uh, run 10 minutes over, so I think we'll just wrap everything up and so um, with the questions. So thank you very much. It's been great to have such a varied audience today, an engaged audience. So, Shannon, maybe I'll just turn things back to you just to close things up. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again, Volker. Um, and Karen, thank you so much for uh, coming today and, and presenting to us. Uh, we'll be sending the winner of the, uh, the engagement draw uh, by email later today. So thank you very much for all your questions that you, you have all sent in. Um, it was much appreciated and, and really helped add to the discussion. A couple of closing notes. Uh, the next webinar is going to be following along this, this journey. So we've seen how, how is the, the plant protein uh, extruded and created and then what happens next how is it turned into an actual product so we'll be learning about that with the Nate Culinary Institute they'll be doing a, a plant protein cooking demonstration on June 29th and letting us know some of the things that they're working on in their innovation lab we'll be sending out a survey after this and we do ask that you, you fill it out so that we know how to improve if you're looking to get in contact with Volker or Karen you can learn more about uh, what they're working on at their website dil-ev.de as well we can include this in the, the email that we'll send out after the webinar video will be posted in a few days on ppaa.ca as well we'll send out a link to everyone shortly after the event and we thank you so much for attending the fifth webinar so webinars are a, a new way of sharing information with our members and and their guests and we thank you so much for coming and hope to see you at another one thank you bye, -bye.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, bye bye. Have a good day. Thank you.